morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to Grand Rounds this morning. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge uh, Denise from United Therapeutics for supporting us this morning. And even though it's dark out and the Vikings and the Gophers lost, we have Tim Henry to brighten up our morning <laughs> this morning. And, and uh, before I, I introduce Tim, I want to acknowledge Dr. Frank Aguirre, who's here from Prairie Cardiovascular in Springfield, uh, has been a member of our research team with the Midwest STEMI Consortium, and to Dr. Robert Herman, who is uh, helping us with a grant on artificial intelligence analysis of ST elevation MIs. And so, um, to paraphrase Paul Siraja, <laughs> Tim is sort of like Brett Favre, he can't stay away from Minnesota. And we're really glad to have you back. As you know, Tim was a professor of medicine at the U for many years and was director of research at this institution also for many years. And his DNA is, is intricately uh, involved in, in the works that we do today. Uh, after he left here, he was uh, at the uh, Cedar sinai as chair of cardiology there for several years. And then Dean Kariakis uh, recruited Tim to Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, where he is currently the Linder Chair of Research at that institution, and has uh, written over 600 manuscripts. Many of, of us in this room are co-authors with Tim. He's widely respected internationally for his work in interventional cardiology and stem cell research, and he has a special interest in helping patients who are at the end of their rope, so to speak, and this morning he's going to share with us his uh, options for the no-option patient. Welcome him back, my friend. Thank you. Uh, I don't need that. Right? Well, it's... Uh, let's see. Yeah. All right. Absolutely delighted to be here. And so what we'll do is um, sort of give you some insights into refractory and, you know, I would actually say in many ways this whole concept of having a refractory engine and having things really started in Minneapolis. And we'll give you a few of those. And a lot of this data comes. So in terms of disclosure, I don't own anything, but I think almost every refractory engine at trial in the last 20 years, I've been on the Stern Committee or um, uh, uh, at least uh, for the national PI. So, and then the other disclosures mainly is really all of this belongs to you. Uh, a lot of what we talk today really is uh, Minneapolis Heart for sure, and I'll give you some fun insights into that. So what about the problem? So the scope of refractory angina, and it's funny because, um, you know, 10 years ago, people would say, are these patients who drink refractory, but do these patients exist? Then we developed CTO, PCI, now they're everywhere. Um, and the point is, um, there is an increasing number of patients that have uh, ongoing chest pain. It's estimated almost 20 million Americans have chest pain. Hard to get those numbers, of course. Um, but 10 to 15 percent of patients who have a cardiac catheterization have disease that's not amenable to revascularization. These are, I'm going to talk more about it, but chronic tonal occlusions, degenerated vein grafts, diffuse disease, you know the patients. But a couple of really important things. If you look at the COURAGE trial, um, at the end of the year, 42% of the patients in the medical arm still had chest pain, and 34% of the patients in the PCI arm still had chest pain. And if you look in the ischemia trial, they did it a little bit different. They just said who was angina-free. But at one year in the PCI arm, 60% were angina-free, which means 40% still have angina. And only 25% in the medical arm were free, which means 75% still have angina. So even with medical therapy and PCI, a lot of people still have angina. So this is out there. Part of the problem is, and we've done come a long ways to change this, is the terminology. So no option patients, refractory angina, advanced coronary disease, non-revascularizable, people use all these different words. And until just recently, there is really no codes. And there was no natural history data. So all the natural history data actually comes from here. And I'll show you that. And it was said in the past that these patients had high morbidity and mortality. Now, it depends on how you count the patients. So this is actually a nice paper that we just had in CERC interventions. So we looked at it from two ways. On one, we started the pyramid of who has a cardiac catheterization. 
And on the other side, we hit the start of the page, uh, pyramid with who has angina. But the point is you get to the top of the pyramid, and if you say class three, four, or what we call no option disabling angina, that group of people is about 25 to uh, 75,000 people in the United States. And that's a group of people that can get in clinical trials. So even though 20 million people have angina, they can't all qualify for these refractory angina trials, which are much different. Now, another really important principle with refractory angina is this one. And that is, these are no option patients. There's symptoms, there's coronary anatomy, and there's myocardial perfusion. And they all don't go together. And it's really, I think this is an interesting thing, why, how it makes it challenging when you look at these, the patients to balance the symptoms, perfusion, and anatomy. Now another, this was a really good because uh, within uh, six months, we had a state-of-the-art paper in CERC intervention, and we had another one in JAK intervention. But I like them because they are very different. And one of the key ones that I liked in particular about the Jack Intervention paper, which I did with this Italian group, is this issue about angina. So we all think about supply and demand, but the point is there's a really important neurogenic component of angina. And I think that's another thing that makes this whole thing complicated is how do people perceive their chest pain? And some people have no chest pain at all, despite horrible ischemia. Some people have chest pain all the time. And so I think that's another really important. So this is actually we can't game and you know, with the whole Optimus program, you know, that started here. And we had a, you know, it was more and more consults for patients who had, you know, no options, and we had a lot of different options for them. And so we thought, you know, do you want to send your mother six hours to go to the no option clinic? Hmm. We thought, no, we need a better name for that. So the, <laughs> this is our research coordinators here. Optimus program is Options in Myocardial Ischemic Syndrome Therapy. So this was really the first refractory angina program in the United States. It was here. And the goal was to improve quality of care for a unique and growing subset of patients, to define the long-term outcome, natural history, and predictors of outcome, and then to provide unique treatment options for those patients, both clinically available and novel research things. And I think we did that, and we're gonna show you some of the data. And that this was the point, would you rather send your mother to the no option clinic? Didn't sound good to me, kind of like the heart failure clinic. So a few things to start with. So are these people really out there? Are they high risk? Can you stratify the risk? And they are, are they always an option? All of these papers actually came from here. So we have a database of about 3,000 refractory angina patients. It's now we are growing it as we go. Um, in the past, so in, 1900, in the 1990s, there was a study from Cleveland Clinic that did 500 consecutive angiograms. They found 12% of the patients had, uh, were symptomatic, documented ischemia, and it correlated with previous bypass and number of disease vessels. So they estimated 100 to 200,000 patients a year. But then that went on, that 59 patients, then they looked at, they had a mortality of 17%, they had a rehospitalization rate of 128%, an MI rate of 25%. So based on this tiny little cohort, everybody said these are terrible patients, they die all the time, they have MIs all the time. They do get readmitted all the time. But we really looked at that because we really didn't believe that was true. So we actually did this over again. Nice paper, it was actually the lead paper in CCI and highlighted um, uh, 500 consecutive patients. These are at MHI. And what we did find is about 29% of the patients had incomplete revascularization. And then we divide it into complete versus incomplete. Interestingly, in this cohort, only 15% of the patients had normal coronaries, and that's due to John, because there is a, this, that's not true in actually most angiographic programs, but because we had a strong CTA program, very few normals made it in. But if you look at this group over there, 29% um, had incomplete revascularization, and fully 16% were not candidates for revascularization. Now we looked at the two groups, and if you saw, the uh, incomplete revascularization group did worse in red, 
but that was about 15% mortality at three years. So that's a lot different than what had been previously reported. So then we looked at it and we looked, this was the first paper we published, and this is the first natural history paper that was published with refractory angina, was in European Heart Journals. I'm seriously, one of my, it would cer certainly fit in one of my top 10 papers from my career. Um, 1,200 patients. These are patients used to smoke, but now they stop because they're having chest pain all the time. 36% diabetics, 30% heart failure, and then 75% previous MI, previous cabbage, previous PCI. So lots of revascularization. And the overall mortality was only 17.4% uh, um, at five years, and 64% was a cardiovascular. So this is the curve that defines refractory angina. And I will tell you, I am 100% uh, sure of this curve because Three years in a row, we, we predicted the number of deaths in the cohort within two. The one year we were right on, one year one off, and one year two. So this curve is absolutely accurate. And it's not much worse than age-matched controls with stable angina. And it's not that far off age-matched controls, period. So the point is, more, mortality is no longer the issue with these patients, it's quality of life. They live a long time. And so I used to have a thing, I probably won't say it because this is being recorded, I'll tell you that afterwards. <laughs> now, who are these patients? So another really important uh, thing that I think you wanna talk, what we did with this whole area is, uh, uh, this is with uh, uh, Mark Jalakor, uh, at Montreal Heart at the time, there's four really phenotypes that we fit in. And I love phenotype A because phenotype A used to be called syndrome X, which is now uh, Inoka or Anoka. And I feel really happy about because that would not have been refractory angina 10 years ago. But they uh, have ongoing chest pain, they're not candidates for revascularization. And what we have just by sort of a little bit of force of nature put them in the category, now everyone considers it refractory angina. And I'm gonna end the talk with them because this might be the most important group of people that we need to work on. So phenotype B is the limited territory whack. This is, this is a classic CTO patient, one or two CTOs, and we do a very good job of that, we come back. Uh, phenotype C is the type 1 or 2 diabetic, so diffuse distal and side branch disease. And then phenotype D is the advanced coronary disease, three bypasses, 17 PCIs, right? And those are very four different patient populations, if you think about it. But they're all kind of in this bundle of refractory angina. So another one, these are another uh, paper that came from here. These are no option uh, patients, not candidates for revascularization. Is that true? Well, if you looked at every clinical trial, subsequently in the trial, about you know 20% of people had subsequent revascularization. So we actually looked at in the in the Optimus database who had revascularization, and it turns out that 25% of people just under two years had a subsequent revascularization. So who are those people? So 48% were new lesions, and these are mostly cabbage patients. 21% of people developed restenosis. So 69% were new lesions. And then 30% were existing lesions. And these are big difference between those patients. The existing patients, in other words, you looked at their angiogram, you said you're not a candidate for revascularization. They're having pain, 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 and now you say, okay, let's do it. So this is getting your third bypass at Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic, or this is getting a high-risk PCI. That group does poorly. So the existing lesions have, have bad outcomes. But the new lesions actually did super well. So this, they're not the same patient population, but this, I think, explains that issue. And that's why it's really important when you see the patient to actually look at their most recent angiogram and say, is there a place where they could actually get progression of disease? So what we did when you came to the clinic is, um, and now I've helped establish refractory angina clinics all over the United States, um, and really I think every large uh, cardiology group should have one. 
um, because it's number one, good patient care, but number two, um, it's good business plan. And uh, it, so what we do is we look at optimal medical management. Are they on best risk factor modification? We look at revascularization options. So when I see a patient, I have all their previous records, I have all their previous angiograms. And I see now in, in my Tuesday clinic, I'm seeing an average of six new refractory angina patients per week. They come from all over the, what they call the Midwest, but I, I, could, I don't think it's the Midwest. <laughs> We're east of Atlanta, is that the Midwest? <laughs> and anyway, um, so then what we do is, uh, after you review the medical therapy and revascularization options, we say, what are the things? So we have angiogenesis, I'm gonna talk about these, EECP, neurostimulation, novel drugs, TMR, and then novel interventional techniques, and there's a number of them. And I'm gonna to touch on those a little bit today. So what about EECP? So are you guys still doing it? Okay, good. Uh, you know, this is actually one of the few good things, and actually I think it's a resurgence. I love this picture because this is from 30 years ago, and this was the most commonly approved option for these patients in the United States. And the, so actually, this is what it looked like 30 years ago. It's much better than that now. And there's a lot of people actually, if you actually go to uh, Lifetime Fitness, they have a, a, you can actually get a variation of ECP while you sit there. Um, and uh, ECP, uh, the physiology is just like a balloon pump. So three sets of cuffs, inflate, and during um, diastole, you push blood into the coronaries, and that increases shear force stress. And then, there, then in systole, there, the cuffs deflate, and it decreases afterload. So the physiology is exactly like a balloon pump, and it's been used acutely for people really effective like a balloon pump. So uh, this, it was approved based on the MUSTI ECP trial, which was a sham trial. Um, there was not an improvement in overall exercise, but there was an improvement in the time to ST depression. There was a significant reduction in angina. Um, and what you look at, if you look at ECP, about 75% of patients get better. And they continue to get better for one month following. So if you're really gonna test them, you have to say uh, one month. The other thing interesting about EECP, this has now become probably the best treatment for long COVID. So we just did two things. We have a paper that's in press that we hope will be um, simultaneous with HTA, which we have over 100 patients with microvascular angina or ANOCA with EECP. <laughs> we have another paper with 250 patients with long COVID because long COVID patients have microvascular dysfunction. We can, we'll talk about maybe at the end. So what you do with the ECP, total 35 hours, you can either do it an hour a day uh, for seven weeks, or you can do it twice a day for three and a half weeks, paid for by all insurances. It's cost effective. It really is effective. The problem is logistically, it's difficult to do. And the, all people in the United States are not available to them. TMR is the second thing approved for refractory engine. The only two things officially approved for refractory engine in the United States. And that's where we put laser holes in the heart. The mechanism was um, if you put injury, the injury would stimulate angiogenesis or you cause denervation. The problem is the direct trial where you did endocardio laser therapy was negative and there was actually more um, uh, morbidity than there was benefit. And if you look at the surgical TMR, you'll notice that half of the trials had more mortality than the medical therapy, right? So I don't like TMR. It's very, used very seldom, especially as standalone. I think it can be used in conjunction with cavity some places. They are getting paid for it, so there are still some holdouts of people that do it. But... Um, I don't like it because remember, uh, the, the mortality, overall mortality for this patient population is very low. So you don't want to do things that put them at risk. The other one is neurostimulation. So this was actually in early 2000s. This was a treatment of choice for refractory angina in European uh, uh, Heart Journal. Uh, had a, a uh, um, position paper. And we did a lot of this early on, but I'm not a fan, and here's why. These people live a long time, 
It works short term, but it's just like a pacemaker. You just have to keep it taking in and out. And I don't know if I knew anybody that had long term. It might work for a year or two years or three years, but it's not a long term thing and it's pretty expensive. So this is neurostimulation is approved for back pain but it's not necessarily approved for angina, but you can do it for the hard person. And what they, what they do is it decreases pain perception, but it does not block your ability to know myocardial infarction, decreases sympathetic tone. There's actually been shown that, uh, data that you actually improve perfusion by PET. So there is some things with it. You basically, um, it's a surgical procedure. You stimulate uh, the patient actually um, uh, stimulates their, where their angina is, uh, and that's how you decide where to placement. It's a pretty simple procedure if you have an anesthesiologist that can work with you. And w one of the key things about it when we did it is, when you have it on, it's kind of like a TENS unit. When you turn it on, it works. When you turn it off, their angina comes back. So it's really kind of a blocking mechanism. We actually did the sham, so I was the PI for this trial. Unfortunately, it rolled poorly, and so there was no difference between groups, but part of that problem was uh, where we had, uh, we put a stimulator in everyone, and then half the group didn't, turned it on for one minute a day, the other group turned it on, uh, you know, for the entire day. Um, the problem is it was underpowered, so I, th I think we'll never really know the answer, and we're not gonna go back. What about pharmacology? So some interesting things about pharmacology, renosine, we're gonna talk about a minute in a minute. L-arginine is a precursor for nitric oxide and actually is effective for certain people. Uh, and in Embryo, there's a brand new drug that's like trimetazine. Trimetazine is available um, outside the United States, but it changes the way the heart uh, metabolizes energy. And it's actually quite effective. This got derailed by COVID, but should be available next year. We have a large trial, and will also probably work for microvascular angina, by the way. So this is L-arginine. Actually, um, uh, Amir Lehrman did a lot of this work and showed you increase uh, nitric oxide uh, production, you increase blood flow by coronaries, um, you improve erectile function, always good for it as a side effect, uh, by the way. And so, all of these things have been shown, but you have to take eight grams a day. And it's not easy to get eight grams a day of it. We have a few patients who are, it's very effective, but it's not my first choice. Now, renosine, it's interesting about renosine. It inhibits the late um, ion channels, uh, prevents calcium overload. And we initially thought renosine worked by changing metabolism, probably not. It's probably this issue about preventing calcium overload and preventing diastolic dysfunction, quite frankly. Now, an interesting thing about renosine, because renosine was approved based on the ERICA trial, and the ERICA trial was not for refractory angina. But we enrolled, so we had a whole number of patients that were gonna go in the trial. Uh, we, May Epis Heart enrolled 11, and most of the trial patients got enrolled outside the United States, and the trial stopped very quickly. But our 11 patients had a ton of angina. Now, I had so many queries. This patient has 200 episodes of angina a week. Yep, they did. And, and if we did a little back of the envelope calculation, if Many Epis Heart, if we had not got in and put those 11 patients in the trial, the trial would have been negative. And here's why. So what they did is they randomized people, um, initially 500 BID versus placebo, and then the FDA said you had to go against one drug that's at max, and so they picked amlodipine 10. So they compared renosine to amlodipine 10. And this is the issue, if you see, this is, it was a uh, significant decrease, but you'll see there's a pretty strong placebo effect, but there is a, well, the, it decreased the angina only by 1.7 episodes per week, per week. But look at this. Most of the patients had less than four and a half episodes of angina a week. That trial would have been negative. So you take out our 11 patients, trial's negative. So fascinating thing because it, about who you enroll in clinical trials. And so, <clears throat> and it's really interesting. We had to fight to get those patients in because the U.S. Uh, enrollment for renosine was only open for about a month. 
It was amazing it, when you look back. Now what else we did, we actually did a nice trial where we looked at true refractory angina patients. We enrolled 100 consecutive patients and we said, how does renolazine really work for refractory angina patients? And uh, these are true no option patients. So at the end of one year, and it's funny because this seemed like a very simple trial, but this, this paper has had a lot of citations. And then we did a follow-up at three years too. And basically the bottom line is um, uh, about 60% of patients stay on renolazine forever. And about 40% of patients are these like incredible renolazine responders. And then the 30 or 40% that don't, it's because number one, either too many side effects or it costs too much and the benefit's not worth the cost. But still, it's a very effective agent for it. All right, next one we're gonna move on to, what about growing new blood vessels or hold the stem cells? So we did a ton, we probably have more angiogenesis here than any place else, and I'm gonna come back to that, is where is this role? So can we really grow new blood vessels? Preclinically, this is incredibly effective incredibly effective. Every model that you've done, protein, gene, and cell therapy work in preclinical models, for sure. So what are some key things, and then these are sort of, I think, key points about refractory angina. This is the placebo-controlled refractory angina trials, and this is the results of the placebo group. So the point about a refractory angina trial is you have to have a double-blind placebo-controlled trial because these are, think about this, these are patients with no hope. Now all of a sudden you're putting them in a clinical trial. And this is probably of all the things that we've done, the strongest placebo effects. So you have a solid almost 40 to 60 second improvement in exercise time in the placebo group. So you have to beat that. Okay, and <clears throat> so that's a real thing. And this is a nice paper, again, I did with Mark, uh, where we talked about uh, the, the overall, uh, first of all, angina fluctuates. There's a regression to the mean. You have the Hawthorne effect, the placebo effect. So on top of all that, you have to have a therapeutic effect. And so doing an uh, uh, angina trial is not that simple. Now, a few examples of this. So this was here, and we were the number one enroller. This is the largest gene therapy trial to be presented, and it gives you a little thing. This is in 2007. The co-primary endpoint was um, uh, exercise time, and no significant difference. The mistaken agent is we put patients with class two in, not just class three and class four. And if you look in, in um, the, uh, I don't have it on this slide, I guess, but the class two patients had significant variability. If you just look at class three and class four, exercise time is significant in this trial. And more importantly, this is an anti-anginal drug, right? If you look at the whole group, Everyone thinks about this as a negative trial. It was not a negative trial. There's a significant, six months and one year, there's a significant improvement of angina. And this was just given intracoronary, and this was with, you know, old vectors. And so we're going to come back to this concept of gene therapy, because I will tell you that I believe in the next five years, we're going to be using um, gene therapy for refractory angina for sure. So did you get gene therapy or cell therapy? So another really fun story, I think, is cell therapy. This is preclinical data that shows CD34 stem cells are more potent than bone marrow mononuclear cells. So CD34 positive stem cells are endothelial progenitors, okay? This is really good preclinical data. That was with rabbits and rats. This is with pigs. And this is an amyloid constrictor model. So you close off the circumflex and you create slowly and you create the area of ischemia. And then we inject it into that zone. CD31 is the pig equivalent of CD34. And you see a significant improvement in um, the uh, uh, ischemia. 
So that really strong preclinical data. So then we did a whole series of trials where we actually did the Nova catheter. You go across the arc valve. I think personally, maybe Emerson Perrin, but between Jay Travers, myself, and Emerson Perrin have the most experience doing intramyocardial injections in the whole world. And uh, we did a lot of it, and we actually did it very safely. And this is the uh, most important trial, and I'll concentrate a minute. Who gets in these trials? So on the left. Class three or class four angina on optimal medical therapy, not candidates for revascularization, documented evidence for ischemia, and exercising between three and 10 minutes on a modified groups. Why do I do it? Because basically this is a pattern for every refractory angina trial, and that's what we're doing for Quisira, which hopefully you guys are getting into Quisira very shortly. Um, but <clears throat> so we randomized this to two different doses, cell therapy versus placebo. Everyone got GCSF. Everyone then got apheresis. And everyone got intramyocardial injection. So if anything, it wasn't a true placebo because some people think GCSF by itself can be, is an effective agent. And this is what we saw. So there was a um, six episodes per week reduction. Remember, renolazine was approved by less than two episodes per week. This is a whopping decrease in angina. That's a whopping decrease, strongly statistically significant. And this is improvement in exercise time. There's no other treatment that's ever improved exercise time in refractory angina. More than a minute improvement. And so that we were super excited about that. Plus, if the event rates, if you looked at it, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come back to that. There was less mortality and there was less um, uh, major adverse events. So then FDA made us do the <clears throat> definitive trial. This is called the RENEW trial. Two important things. In their ultimate wisdom of the FDA, they wanted a on blinded standard of care. We said this is really stupid and it triples the cost of the trial. So imagine this, you get randomized to your the trial. You're a no option patient. And then you find out, oh, you're not you're not in the trial. You're just gonna be the on blinded standard of care. What do you think your first trip is? I've got chest pain, I'm on my way to the emergency department, right? It was stupid from the start, and of course, that group of patients had a huge number of hospitalizations, did very bad, and then it, it really markedly made it more expensive. Um, and therefore, the trial stopped early because the company said, we just can't afford it. And so um, this is, from my perspective, an FDA failure. But we looked at the data with, with 110 patients, Cell therapy still had an increase in exercise time, identical to the phase two trial. A significant reduction in angina, identical <coughs> to the phase two trial. And a significant, look at the standard of care had a MACE rate of 67.9%, right? I mean, it was huge. And um, mortality was significantly lower in the CD34 arm. So then what we did, I say, oh, Lord, here comes circumstances beyond our control, because the, the, it wasn't safety or efficacy. It was, uh, it was business plan and FDA decision on how you do a clinical trial. And instead, I look at that as opportunity lost. We then published another really important panel where it did, there was three consecutive double-blind placebo-controlled trials with CD34. <clears throat> Significant improvement in angina. Significant improvement in exercise time, significant reduction in mortality. This should be available. And actually, in Holland, uh, bone marrow mononuclears are available. There are countries around the world. It is. But it comes down to the cost of uh, apheresis or G, uh, GCSF first for five days, apheresis, and then the intramyocardial injections. And it comes down to probably uh, seventy-five dollars to $100,000 per patient. It's not a business plan that works. And so that went. So here's the thing. These are the placebo other trials that have actually shown to improve exercise time beyond CD34. Nothing. Nothing's ever improved exercise time. So this is the challenge of this field, for sure. Uh, we're going to come back. So I think personally, uh, I say this about CD4. I go home today, cured me with this new miracle drug. I'm afraid it'll be years before it's approved in humans. 
And that, that's really what's happened. Now, just to show you with cell therapy, this is a meta-analysis of all the cell therapy trials in refractory angina, proven in mortality, proven in angina, proven in quality of life, proven in exercise time, super consistent. Super consistent. So there really is an ability to grow new blood vessels, but it's not available. So anyway, um, I would say the fine pop patient population with its huge unmet need, that, and the problem is blood flow, right? The problem is blood flow. And CD34 is the perfect one, a large and uh, small and large animal models to confirm it. Double blind placebo controls, phase one, two, three, all show it. Meta analysis show it safe. And why isn't it available? It's a, it's a failure. It's a sad thing for me, actually, when you look at this. So to know that we're going forward, though, is two trials. The Xylocor trial is a gene therapy trial with a better vector that encodes for three isotopes of VEGA. We just published this um, at ESC and uh, the phase two, and this shows a really, I think, really excellent improvement in PEP and improvement in exercise time. So this is now going to go to a phase 2B. We're deciding whether it'll be phase 2B or phase 3. So gene therapy is alive and well, and I think there's several agents out there, but in particular, um, the Xylocor trial is an important one. And there is still a stem cell trial that's ongoing. This is actually the CardiAmp trial, where you actually... Do a bone marrow, check for CD34 cells, and then inject them straight in the cath lab. So the, both of those are still going. So, and then the other thing I'll say is there's been this big proliferation of stem cell clinics. Don't do it this way. This is go to Mexico, pay $20,000, and then they give you IV stem cells. It doesn't work and it's dangerous. So I think that this whole uh, cell therapy thing is interesting. Now let's shift a little bit to interventional. So first of all, it's a really important part of having a good refractory engine thing. The CTO group is actually our best friends. And this was a little slow coming, but now I will tell you it's really come all across the country really where the CTO people realize 10, five or 10% of the patients they see they can't do, and 20% of the patients that they do still have angina. So this is a perfect marriage, and um, so we are doing about 350 CTOs a year, and, um, and Jared Frizzell is a wonderful, and between Jared and then the director of our Women's Heart Clinic, which is uh, Odami Casada, the three of us have, we really have the most refractory, of, I, it's there everywhere, and it's, uh, <clears throat> we're super busy, but it's nice because we have such a great relationship. And uh, Jared and I are in clinic, and we look at probably um, five to ten patients every week about what the best option is. So when you have a refractory engine clinic, the CTO group is essential for you to work together. Essential, okay? And I think you all know about the, the CTO, but, you know, you can make a big difference in a lot of people's lives. But now I'm going to shift a little different because this is, I think, really the unmet need is a microvasculature. And that's what the rest of what we're going to talk about. And first, I'll start by talking about the coronary sinus reducer. So this is the Beck procedure. And if bypass surgery would have never been developed, we would have been still doing this. But what they did is a reduction of the coronary sinus, changes outflow, and it changes endocardial to epicardial blood flow in the heart. And this actually worked for patients when we didn't have bypass. So there's a series of patients. Uh, this was in the uh, 1950s. And the extension of that now is the reducer. So this is like an hourglass-like stint, and you put it in the coronary sinus. And it's designed to get restenosis, except in the middle part. So it creates, you create a great, an outflow gradient in about a month. So uh, we've now put in, uh, we have the most in the United States, we put in are probably 30. Um, and I'm the co-national PI uh, with uh, Greg Stone for the trial. And this is really the issue. You see what where you put it, you go uh, IJ. It, it, it literally takes us um, under 30 minutes for sure to put it in. And then what it does is it changes the endocardial to epicardial blood ratio. 
So, um, you know, I could spend more time on it, but the other thing it does is it improves coronary flow reserve. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So this is what it looks like down term. For the heart fair people in group, don't worry if you ever had, first of all, refractory <laughs> injury patients have preserved ejection fraction. This is not a heart fair population. But if you ever had to do CRT and do it, you can actually just go into coronary science, blow up a balloon, flattens right out, and you can do put anything you want in the coronary sinus. So it's super safe. And actually, we went to the FDA. It's approved in Europe. They've done more than 4,000. We actually had a vote positive for safety, and we had a vote uh, pause, uh, borderline for efficacy. But um, we thought we were going to win just because these are no option patients, but they didn't. So we have to do one more large trial. And what kept it from going on before faster was really just money. Um, this is the data. The first data showed a reduction of class 3 angina down to 1.6. This is the, actually the New England Journal paper that was in 2015. They had 52 patients that got the reducer, 52 patients that got sham. The same design on what I just talked to you about. Um, uh, there was a significant reduction in angina any way that you looked at it. They did bicycle exercise, which was suboptimal, but there was improvement in that as well. If you look at these patients by CT over time, they stay open. Shocking, really, but they don't close. But there's high, that's very high velocity across that thing. I would have thought more would close off, but they don't. In fact, it's never been recorded to close. So um, the, that's important. Actually, I didn't put that slide in, but right now um, they've changed the way they are doing it. Shockwave bought NeoVast. So the coronary science reducer trial now is actually paying for people. So you guys need to get in this trial. Um, it's a really important trial, and I think your interventionists will love it, and it's a great option for people for sure. Um, and so, um, uh, and right now we're actually enrolling pretty well. The goal is to have about 350 patients. Um, shockwave therapy is a really interesting one. This is percutaneous shockwave that is focused in the ischemic zone. Not, none of it being done in the United States, but it is a, it, there, the evidence is that it's really simple and, and effective. And again, what limits it is uh, financial things, but it's at least know that it's out there. So just for the record, these are people, bypass didn't work, PCI didn't work, medical therapy didn't work, and tender loving, tender loving care didn't work. You know, these are, it's tough patients. But another thing we showed in the Optimist Clinic here is that at the end of one year, 85% of patients had an improvement in their angina. So the point is, if you look at people thoughtfully and take care of them in a way, you can actually find something to make their pain better. Current trials, we're doing the Xylocor trial, we're doing Imbria, which is the metabolic inhibitor, the CD34 and bone marrow, and then Quisara 2 So there's four real areas that we're doing right now. And then the last thing I'm gonna end up is with the microvasculature. Because now I feel really happy that, you know, it's funny, usually it takes a long time to get people to change the way they think. But we've now got people thinking and realizing that these patients are refractory angina. So if you look at CAS, and just CAS across the United States, 30 to 40% of patients have non-obstructive disease. But they got there because they were having chest pain, right? And it's more common in women, 75% of women, and in particular, coronary flow reserve, if you look at it, strongly predicts MACE. And the biggest MACE it predicts, actually, is HEFPEF. So I'm not going to talk about today HEFPEF, but 75% of HEFPEF patients have abnormal coronary flow reserve. So I, I know you guys are doing a little bit of, of uh, flow reserve. You need to be doing a lot. So right now, I'm doing one whole day a week where I do at least six cases. My problem is I can't get it. I've got, I have too many uh, between the refractory angina and the, the microvascular angina patients. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough days. But I'm actually doing a national webinar tonight about the importance of the microvasculature. All of the tough areas that we have that are on that need. In STEMI, it's microvascular obstruction. IMR correlates with microvascular obstruction, right? And we have a bunch of new ways to look at it. That's who does poorly. 
Post PCI and post CTO, 25 to 30% of people still have chest pain. Some of that's diffuse disease, a lot of it's microvascular dysfunction. If you look at HEFPEF, 75% of the problem there is, is microvascular dysfunction. And then you have, of course, ANOCA and INOCA. But if you look at other kids, Scott just published, a, uh, uh, or I'm not sure if it's published, but submitted recurrent Takasubus. I did a recurrent Takasubu patient um, a couple days ago that had flow reserves of 1.5. And then uh, uh, HCM. Angina patient with HCM, literally, another patient I'm going to show tonight, uh, flow reserve of 1.2. My God, like seriously, can't even, it doesn't even change your flow reserve. And these are with Doppler, so I'm, I still have both Doppler available as well as Coral Flow. So I think the microvasculature is really the next frontier, and if you're not involved in it, you're going to be missing the boat, okay? So um, this is what we do. I, I'm not going to go through the things, but we do. Um, I do both Doppler and Coraflow, so you can measure flow reserve and IMR by either thermodilution or by Doppler. And then we also do acetylcholine to look mid-dose acetylcholine, looks at endothelial-dependent microvascular dysfunction, and high-dose acetylcholine looks for epicardial coronary spasm. So um, if you look at the microvasculature, Cell therapy works there too. This is bone marrow monitor nuclear cells. This is actually CD34 cells. We improve the, the uh, we improve coronary flow reserve from 2.08 to 2.68, and this was given intracoronary for women with microvascular dysfunction. You can see marked decrease in angina and quality of life. All all got better. Again, why are we doing it? Business plan. Too expensive. And that will change with gene therapy. This is the coronary science reducer. So in, my, in women with microvascular dysfunction. So four different groups around the world now have shown this. Uh, the important things, to, of course, your FFR doesn't change. But in the middle, significant reduction in your IMR and a significant improvement in your coronary flow reserve. So this is showing that the reducer improves microvascular function. So we actually have a registry, um, part of the COSIRA-2 arm, we have a registry arm for women with microvascular dysfunction. So, um, and this has actually showed, not only did it improve your indices, but you improve your six minute walk and you improve your angina class. So I'm, I'm bullish on that. And so this is our current uh, microvascular trials. The CD34 ended um, the Imbria, warrior trial which is a strategy trial and then the coronary science reducer we're doing and pretty soon we'll be doing the xylocor gene therapy trial so i'm going to end with this when you think of angina so first of all there's a neurogenic component but then there is on the left atherosclerotic disease severe epicardial disease in the middle vasoconstriction and on the right microvascular function these people don't come in one little bucket. Commonly, there's patients that have all three. You have to look for it, you have to diagnose it. And if you do that, the core micro trials show you have a better chance of making them feel better. So what I want you to think about when you think about angina, why are they having angina? And then target why they're having angina. So with that, my last slide is this. I think this is really a heart team approach. So I told you already, so we use cardiac rehab, we use, we have a psychotherapist, we use the surgeons for the appropriate people, um, uh, Jared, the CTO, and uh, uh, Odaimi and the Women's Heart Program are all essential to our refractory energy program. And the reason why we're so successful and get so many people is because people get results. So. Thanks for having me. People still need option, and now I think we have 10 or 15, 10 minutes for a talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 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 And is it from the heart is really the question, and then you go down in the algorithm. Uh, we're able to get coronary flow reserve with MRI. 
uh, quantitative uh, yeah. with our current setup as well as with, with PET. What do you require in order to really say, yes, it's actually from the heart? Yeah, so, uh, so we actually do, there's two things from an imaging standpoint. So stress tests for, now we're just only talking about microvascular disease now. Just microvascular disease. So non-obstructive coronary disease and microvascular. Normal stress tests are worthless. Yep. Okay, all over the map. The two things that I promise are MRI, and this depends on the quality of your institution. So I think the, with the MPRI, which is a measure of your blood flow, I think there's about a 0 0.7, 0 0.8 correlation with Doppler. With PET CT, probably better in the right hands. That might be only five or six or seven people in the United States right now. That's the problem. And so I think PET or MRI are both good. What we do, John, is so uh, we don't cath everybody. I, you know, listen. I'd be, I would not to be get to do anything else. Um, here's what we do: someone has angina, non-obstructive coronary disease. We take a good history. History is pretty good too. Seventy-five percent, I'd say. If you have only exertional chest pain, that's more likely to be microvascular dysfunction. If you have only sporadic chest pain that's more likely to be vasoconstrictive disease. But I will tell you, most people don't just have one or the other. And a lot of people have exertional dyspnea. So what we do is we do uh, empiric therapy first, and if they do great, if you don't have chest pain, or if you have, you know, you can do everything you wanna do in your life, then, what, then good, come back in a year, you know, or six months. But if you still have persistent chest pain or the, the occasional patient that you really need to know why, then we do, we do, do our standard right now because we're not very happy with our pet, um, the way we we're doing it. So we do an MPRI and, and that will help us if, if, and again, that'll push us more, treat it more like microvascular disease. But now, if you still have class three or four sandra, now we come in, we do invasive testing. So the problem with Dopplers is now Dopplers are running out. So I have about 40 left. And I think I'm the only one in the United States. Uh, I think Johan Peak has some in Holland, but I'm the only one in the United States that has Dopplers anymore. And they're making a new one. So in about a year, I think Dopplers, personally, I think Dopplers more reliable. Too much variability with flow reserve with thermal dilution. Too many people doing thermal dilution don't know what they're doing, unfortunately. Um, and what I do is I train a lot of people, so they come and they spend a day. And usually I have like five cases, and I'll do two or three Doppler or and then two or three thermal dilution, so people can see both and get an idea of where you what, what you use it for. But in that group of people. Um, our data is very similar. Remember now, it's not just on selected because you failed the empiric therapy test. And in that group of people, there's 10, and this is very similar to Cormica. About 20% have pure vasoconstrictive disease spasm, about or either microvascular or epicardial. About 60% um, have microvascular dysfunction either endothelial independent, which is flow reserve, or dependent, which is um, an abnormal response to mid-dose mm -hmm. acetylcholine. And then 10% are, are normal. And then 10%, that 10%, you then have non-cardiac pain. And that's helpful to tell people. And sometimes then we push them towards a GI, sometimes we push them to a psychiatrist. You know, <laughs> There is that aspect of this for sure. And then there's about 20% that have both vasoconstrictive and microvascular dysfunction. But I think it's super helpful to know what you have. And, you know, I mean, I don't know why that's, a, you know, the guidelines, the new guidelines, chest pain guidelines make it a 2A recommendation to do invasive testing. And that's based on the Cormica trial, which randomized people to invasive testing or, not, or empiric therapy. And at the end of the year, the invasive testing patients did better, had better quality of life, spent less money. You know, these are the average uh, woman uh, who comes to uh, with microvascular disease 
has had chest pain for seven to 10 years, has seen three different cardiologists, has had four angiograms or CT angiograms, and has had greater than five stress tests, and still doesn't have a diagnosis. I'd call that a waste of money, right? And that's what's happening, right? These people get admitted, they get an angiogram, and insurance companies pay for the angiograms, but don't pay for the, it's, it, we're, making, we're making progress, but you know, this is a, it's a big on that need. And I think in this whole business, I think that of the obstructive coronary disease, a lot of the leftover angina is the microvascular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your honor. You know, great, great presentation. Yeah, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we have four modalities of PET, MR, Doppler, and Therma. Actually, we just got a little stock of... Do you have, you have a few well, Doppler yeah, stock of Doppler wires. So <laughs> Use them <laughs> sparingly. <laughs> but the question is, I, I really like your slide, and I actually really like your paper with the Odaimi that highlights the role of the, of the post-PCI uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction. And I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Should, are there opportunities to be doing more of that? I can tell you that, as you yeah. already know, there are people that are doing more of the post-PCI FFR. But the question is, should we do it also post-PCI assessment of microvascular dysfunction, particularly, uh, maybe you can speak also to the, some of the angiographic efforts of doing angiographic IMR and stuff like that. So, I mean, if you want to do FFR, the point is you can use a coraflow wire and get both. <laughs> right? So, you know, I mean, that's, that's Abbott's FFR wire, too. So you get both. So, but you have to do it different. And I, I'm happy to tell you the protocols that I use for both. Um, so, and I actually have mine down. Um, I, can, I do a Doppler, complete Doppler in 30 or 35 minutes. And I do um, circ LED, LED proximal and distal. Then I do, and that's all pre-nitroglycerin. Then I do acetylcholine, mid and high dose, and then I uh, give nitro, and then I repeat the flow reserve. So with that, in 30 minutes, I have pre and post nitro, I have circ and LED, and I have pre and, po and proximal and distal. For chlorophyll, I do acetylcholine first, and then I do, um, and then I do mid LED and distal LED with IV adenosine, and then I use IC adenosine. So I get a lot, you know, and that takes me about 35 minutes. Yeah. Hey, Tim, uh, great talk. Uh, I want um, to ask your, your thoughts on, you know, you touched upon the half path and microvascular dysfunction. Um, and now there is a therapy that actually, uh, by Edwards, that is increasing coronary flow by the virtue of shunting from the left atrium to the coronary sinus into the right yeah. atrium. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, are we able to increase microvascular resistance indirectly by, by increasing flow? So the answer is I don't know. I don't think anybody's done it yet, right? I don't know. Because these, really patients, they, these patients benefit, and they yeah. walk more, and might they feel be, better. It so might be in flow reserve. It's an indirect, uh, perhaps. You know, I, I will just say, I will, it's um, every day when you do these cases, it definitely they're high maintenance. It's their high maintenance cases, but uh, I will say I see something new every day, and then there's a whole bunch of things that have just been not worked out. Right? And so this group of people that start with high baseline flow. Mm. So if you have high baseline flow, you can't improve your flow reserve, right? So that group of people are different than the group of people that have low baseline flow and can't improve their flow reserve. And so, you know, we're, there's a lot of stuff to work on. And we're, and, you know, another big one now is microvascular spasm. The current def definition of microvascular spasm, this, people think this is a good idea, is you give high dose acetylcholine and you have chest pain and EKG changes, but no epicardial coronary spasm. That's microvascular spasm. <clears throat> <laughs> That's just complete baloney. So what we've done is we have a group of people, and I think Amir feels the same thing, Your Honor, is we have this pre and post. So if your flow reserve pre-nitroglycerin is 1.7, and now I give you nitroglycerin, and your flow reserve goes to 2.8, that's microvascular spasm. And that's, more, that's a more thoughtful diagnosis. Problem is the Europeans start with nitroglycerin, so they don't ever check for it. You know? 
And Lewis, the wise, uh, the wise profile used the, did the, the opposite. Anyway, some minutia, but really fun minutia. Yeah. I guess we have one virtual question. It comes from Dr. Burke. And he's asking, if you exclude the microvascular angina patients, does the mortality of the optimist patients change? Yeah, we have. So I think if you're on treatment, so uh, we, they were lumped into that paper that we had in the um, European Heart Journal. And there was a clear gradient. So between class, if you have class three and class four angina, you had more mortality. But it was equivalent with the, and let me answer it a different way. So we just have a nice paper, again, with, you know, we're doing, still doing a ton of stuff with Minneapolis Heart, by the way. Scott just got an ACC accreditation grant, the Midwest Semi Consortium, we have a lot. But this paper with the Midwest Semi Consortium, we have the largest group of Minoka patients. So these had a SC elevation MI with positive enzymes. And the five-year outcome for that group of people is worse than obstructive coronary disease, mm -hmm. Minoka STEMI. So the point is, Minoka patients do have events, and Inoka patients too. And so, but if you treat them, you can change them. All right.